All right, well, let's begin by reading the passage, Romans 16, verses 17 through 20. And by the way, we, we do need to see the connection here uh, between what Paul says at the, at the front and what he says at the end, and in the middle, how we're supposed to actually accomplish what happens at the end, okay? So, with that in mind, uh, Paul writes this, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, I do believe Paul is addressing the same thing throughout this. He is talking about um, the fact that the enemy is the one who is working to cause this dissension and these hindrances. They, by God's grace, have been uh, avoiding that, and he encourages them to continue to go down that right path. And he says that as they do this, God is going to defeat Satan in their midst. All right, well, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, but first of all, let's be reminded what we saw last week because it was so very important. Last week, we saw so many examples of what our Lord wants us to be. Those who are devoted to Him, whose lives are given to His service. And again, it's going to look different for each one of us and according to our strengths and gifts and resources and energies and so forth. But whatever we have, He wants us to devote to Him. Now, as we looked over those Paul greeted, this is what stood out in his commendations, okay? He called Priscilla and Aquila his fellow workers. They opened their home, not just one, but three homes, actually, to the church. They risked their lives for the Lord and for Paul. Mary worked hard for the saints in Rome. Andronicus and Junius went to prison with Paul. Urbanus worked with him as well. Apelles was approved because of his labors in the gospel. Paul referred to Tryphena and Tryphosa as workers in the Lord. Persis was one who worked hard in the Lord. By the way, do you see the trend? <laughs> Working hard, risking whatever needs to be risked to promote the, the kingdom of heaven. When Paul encouraged the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 to labor for God's glory, he pointed to his own example. That, that's something that... I think we would all like to be able to do in our own lives, point to our example. But he says in Acts 20, verses 34 through 35, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. And remember the, Lord, the words of our Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. As the Lord has blessed us uh, with these various resources and abilities, He wants us to use them for His glory. And one of those is, is strength. If He's given us strength and endurance and energy, use it for His glory. And again, in each of these examples Paul's given to us, as well as the example he's given to us of himself, he was simply following the Lord. And I just wanted to bring this up because we saw it in our midweek study. The idea actually... I think it was in our midweek study. We saw it recently. Um, following the Lord, you know, why? Oh, it was on midweek study. We were looking at the sacraments, okay. Why did the Lord wash the disciples' feet? Was he introducing a new sacrament in the church? No, that's not what he was saying that it was about, but rather he was giving them an example. And he says in John 13, verses 12 through 15, John writes, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, for you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. So what was the foot washing all about? It was meant to be an example of service. Like you can imagine how 
embarrassing that would be as a disciple to have God in human flesh stooping and washing your feet. But that was something they weren't willing to do for each other, but he was willing to do it. And he says, this is what I want you to do for each other. So our service, of course, is to extend to the saints, but also to others who are in need of our help, who are in need of the gospel. Our Lord encourages us throughout Scripture to serve because it's in serving that we are most like Him. Now, having said that, okay, and I brought that up because this is the way Paul has been saying that we can build each other up in Christ, okay? This is how the church is built, okay, through service, but how is it torn down? Okay, that's what he goes on to talk about next, and perhaps what provoked this idea at this particular point in the letter. He goes on to warn against what will tear the church down, and that is the division that Satan constantly is seeking to sow within the church. He's good at it. Okay? We need to be aware of that, and we need to be look, looking out for him, as we were reminded by James. So he begins by explaining that this is Satan's main strategy, and it is effective. Now, you've heard the expression, which I discovered was apparently first coined by John Dickinson, who was one of the founding fathers of our country, and you'll recognize it. United we stand, divided we fall. Now, that, that's an axiom, isn't it? That is a truth that, that applies to every situation. Satan knows that we are strongest when we stand together. And what that means is when we love each other fervently and we agree on God's truth and what God wants done or what the head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, wants done in His church. When we agree on all those things and our love for each other is strong, then we are strong against the enemy. But He also knows that if He can divide us, you know, and He does that by cooling down our love for each other, turning us against each other, making us believe and do things contrary to the Word. He knows that if He can do that, if He can divide us, He can conquer us, He can destroy us. Now, you know, it's interesting. That is something would have been very helpful to know beginning the ministry many years ago, as I did when I started, you know, many moons ago now. I naively thought that my work was going to be mainly of strengthening the church, the body of Christ, against the attacks that would come from the outside, from the persecution, the hatred, the ideas that were in the world, from the beliefs perhaps of false teachers and cults, and certainly that is a part of it. But you know, attacks from without tend to have the opposite effect that Satan wants. It usually causes us to close ranks rather than divide us. As a matter of fact, opposition against the church can even make us close ranks with people we'd never think that we'd necessarily work together with. And, and, you know, you've heard of co-belligerency. I won't get into that right now, but it, it is important. But what I wasn't prepared for was that which turned out to be by far the greatest thing that I had to deal with, the greatest battle for the first 11 years of, of ministering here, and that was division, division within the church. Now, if I had paid closer attention to what Paul said, I can only uh, blame myself. I mean, it's all written here in the Word of God. But it wasn't something dealt with in seminary, you know, so that's kind of strange. But if I had paid closer attention, I might have been better prepared. Paul writes in verse 17, Now I urge you, which means I beg you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you have learned, and turn away from them. He's saying here, watch out for those who would cause division. That's what dissension means. Who would create hindrances. And Paul here may be referring back to what he was talking about in chapters 14 and 15. You know, not using our Christian liberty to put a stumbling block in front of a brother's way, but there are many ways in which we can hinder one another in the faith, not only through stumbling blocks, but we can tempt each other. We can uh, well, we can you know, introduce ideas into each other's minds that might entice us to sin. We can even begin to embrace things that are not necessarily true and begin to use those things in a divisive way by introducing things contrary to the teaching, okay? There's only one thing we need to remember is the Word of God only says 
one thing, okay, not just, not just one truth, but whatever it says on any subject, it only says one thing uh, about it. It doesn't give us varieties of opinions. The opinion is the Lord's opinion, and it's always consistent. And that is what Paul had written to them in the letter, but also how they had been discipled in Jerusalem, okay? He is saying that there are those who would introduce things that are contrary to the teaching that would cause division and hindrances in the flock. By the way, that's the reason why we're going to be looking, why we're looking at what we're looking at in the evening, isn't it? Uh, that we know what the truth is, where the standard is, and stick to that truth. Let that be our guiding light. Let that be the blueprint of the church. Now, the question is, how does this happen? How do these divisions take place? Well, the way it happens, as you know, and, and certainly the way that Thomas Brooks describes it is Satan is the master fisherman who knows, uh, well, he has this hook. He wants to hook you into sin. And he knows exactly how to bait the hook for you and for me. So he calls it the golden bait. And so Satan puts the bait on there that he knows will tempt you, and he dangles it in front of your face until you grab onto it, and then he, he gets you hooked. Well, Paul describes this as um, Satan appearing as an angel of light. And the way he does that is he appears as one who is professing faith in Christ as a strong Christian, maybe a, a Christian leader, or maybe just somebody who comes into the church who kind of wows us with their theological understanding. And what, what he does, or could even be, uh, of course, a gal as well, introduce their own doctrine, their own teaching that is contrary. But because they come clothed with credentials, uh, we are not on our guard. And so we tend to think, if this is a respectable person, we tend to think what they're saying might be the right thing. So how do you know the difference between what is true and what is error? compare it with Scripture, you realize, remember, the Thessalonians, when they heard Paul preach, Paul the apostle, Paul the evangelist of the world, who even did signs and wonders to prove he was from the Lord, how did they determine whether he was giving them the truth? They compared what he said with Scripture, always with Scripture, because that is the only way we can know, not by what this teacher says or that teacher says, it needs to be with the Scripture. Well, Peter tells us that this, you know, the, these introductions of ideas, these divisive types of things, these false teachers entering into the church is inevitable. This is something that happened really to every congregation and will continue to happen. He says um, in his second letter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality. You know, think about what James said, the pleasures of the world. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment um, from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. By the way, there's a lot we can say about that, and I will mention just a couple in just a moment. Now, what Peter is saying is inevitable that false teachers are going to infiltrate the church, and I think perhaps the earliest example we have of this is that of the Judaizers. Remember in Acts chapter 15? Up to this point, the church had been suffering persecution from without and really had very few problems within, but around this point, perhaps the persecution is dying down, and now we're beginning to see things happening within the church. Remember, Luke tells us that some men came from Judea. And Judea, remember, is the center of Jewish Christianity. And they went to Antioch. That was the center of Gentile Christianity. And they began teaching the disciples in Antioch Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now talk about divisive teaching that is not according to the teaching, okay? Now they're still working things out, so this was a very important event in the church. What they were saying is this, yes, we need Jesus. He is the Messiah, but Jesus isn't enough. You Gentiles first need to become Jews, and you need to follow the Jewish traditions. 
That's what it means to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. Well, Paul and Barnabas debated with them. They tried to convince the Gentile believers that that wasn't right. They had to hold on to the gospel and Jesus Christ alone, but apparently they weren't successful. And so that church decided to send Paul and Barnabas along with some of the other leaders to go up to the church at Jerusalem. Why? Because that was the center of Jewish Christianity. That was also the source of the problem. Remember the, the people that came up to Antioch, they came from Judea. So they went to the apostles and the elders to see what they had to say. So they met, they debated, they heard testimony, not the least of which Peter's testimony regarding how the Lord had saved Cornelius and his household without their being circumcised. You know, they didn't have to become Jews first. And then James, after quoting the prophet Amos, who spoke of this very thing, concluded this at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, verses 19 through 20. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. And what James was saying here is that Gentile converts don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to keep the traditions, but... They should be careful not to use their liberty in Christ to offend their Jewish brethren. That's why that list of those four things, and I'll just say briefly, fornication here more likely is not referring to sexual immorality. That's usually done in secret. But I think what he's saying here, and Greg Bonson is the one who argued this point, so I'll give him the credit for it, is, is, is using the word in the sense of uncleanness, but, but not sexual uncleanness. The word can, be, can refer to other types of uncleanness, which would be offensive to the Jews if you were guilty of it in their presence. Now, what I want us to note here, though, is this, that yes, the Lord was still working. Yes, there was testimony. But the deciding uh, point, the touchstone, that told them what the truth was, was the quote from Amos that James quotes before he renders, as it were, this judgment of the council that God was going to raise up the fallen tabernacle of David so the rest of mankind might seek the Lord. Therefore, he says, it is my judgment. We do not trouble them in this way. He settled the issue through Scripture. This is the point, okay? Through God's authority and not through man's opinion. There was a lot of, there was a lot of opinion the Judaizers had their opinion, and uh, James, uh, well, excuse me, well, James, of course, but also Paul and, and Barnabas had, had their opinion. Peter had his opinion. But it really depended on Scripture. But Satan did not give up so easily. He continued to spread this teaching of the Judaizers into Asia Minor, bringing division there as well, so that Paul had to write to the church in Galatia, and he is addressing the very same issue, and it's believed that that took place after the Jerusalem Council because why wouldn't Paul, writing to the Galatians, make reference to the Jerusalem Council? Because it was addressing this exact issue. But in Galatians 1, 6-8, this is what Paul says about it, about this doctrine that is dividing the church and about those who are promulgating or promoting it. He says, first of all, to the church, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So what did Paul think of the Judaizers at this point? Now, they didn't say that at the Jerusalem Council, did they? But now he is because this is exactly the same teaching. These men are accursed. Now, this is how we should view false teaching and those who are promulgating this type of false teaching. But then he goes on to say also in, in, uh, as far as why this is so serious, in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision... And what he means by that is if you begin to rely on your obedience to the law of God, beginning with circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. It's got to be either Christ or you. can't be both. If you turn to you, 
and your obedience, you are abandoning Christ. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You know, by the way, we can do the same thing. When we begin to think that it's our obedience, our faithfulness that is keeping us in the grace of God, okay, that puts then the burden upon us to maintain our justification. We need to, to trust in Christ alone and not add anything that we do to that work, okay? That, that's the important distinction to see here. They added something that Jewish believers had the liberty to do. They could still circumcise their children. They could still observe the traditions. As a matter of fact, Paul did what he did, remember, in, in Jerusalem in order to prove that he himself was walking according to the traditions. The problem comes when you begin to trust in those things for your salvation. And the only reason I bring that up again is because we often do the same thing. We just don't trust circumcision. We trust our obedience. Now, this wasn't the only attack in the church. Later we see another divisive attack that's considered by many scholars to be the beginning of Gnosticism. Remember, Gnosticism is that view that there are people who have the special knowledge who know how to escape the prison house of the body. Uh, it follows the Greek idea that everything that is material, everything that is matter is evil. And so <clears throat> Jesus could not have become a true man. He only looked like a solid human being. He only took that shape, but he was really a phantom or a spirit. He was only divine and never human. By the way, that is the error we know as docetism, which R.C. explained to us. You know, docetism or dekeo means to only seem or think. That's where they get the word docetism. Jesus could not have been a man. But listen to what John has to say about this in his first letter and what he says about those who promote this idea. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Notice the emphasis on his humanity. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Notice spiritual warfare being addressed here again. The idea of Satan's dividing a congregation through false teaching. We should also note that John specifically says these false prophets that he's referring to in chapter 4, they actually came from within the church, from members of the church embracing these false ideas. But they eventually left because God's people did what they should do, and that is, well, what Paul's going to tell us to do in just a few moments. But he writes in chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they are not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. So the point is, this is how the enemy works. He tries to divide the church from within through false teaching. Let me just mention one other way very briefly. He also does it by making people followers of men rather than by followers of Christ. Okay. He suggested, Satan did, to the some in the Corinthian church, Paul addresses this, that they should follow Paul. He's the great apostle. To others, they should follow Apollos because he's such an eloquent speaker. And to another, Peter, because he's the rock, right? He's the, the one who made that um, profession of faith upon which the church is built. Not built on Peter, but upon his, his profession. These are the two main ways that Satan still divides the church today. This is the reason why there are so many denominations. Okay? Um, yes, we are imperfect, aren't we? We will come to imperfect conclusions. Luther and Zwingli, the great leaders of the Reformation, disagreed to the point where they could barely work together. <clears throat> that had mainly to do with Luther because of his insistence that the real body and blood of Christ was present in the Lord's table. Um, not in the Roman Catholic way, but still in a way that Zwingli would say, no, that, that's wrong. 
okay? Uh, but much, okay, so we, we can be true believers and, and we can embrace the Lord and even be people that He's using mightily and we can still disagree. But a lot of this disagreement and a lot of this division that we see in the church today, <laughs> as R.C. said, you know, the, ladder, the church of the ladder up to heaven one, the, the church of the ladder up to heaven two, uh, you know, and number three and so forth, why we divide over such small issues, a lot of that is the enemy's work. And it also explains why so many people tend to follow teachers and leaders rather than following Christ. Now, again, some of these some of these men should be appreciated. Some of these gals that have been wonderful examples and encouragers should, should be followed because of their experience, because of their insight into Christ, because of their maturity. And again, I could name my favorites. You know, we have Edwards and Spurgeon. We can add to that Sproul and Godfrey, and I think probably everybody uh, really appreciates Ferguson here. Okay, we, we should appreciate them. But they would say, as the Apostle Paul would say to those who wanted to follow him or follow Apollos or Peter, I, do, I wasn't crucified for you. You weren't baptized in my name. You need to follow Christ. But you see, many follow false teachers because of the devil's influence. Paul writes this in verse 18, for such men, he's referring to these who cause these divisions and hindrances, are, such men are slaves not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering words, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. You know, they, they had the salesmen back in those days too. You know, we've got them today. They're all over the media. They're the ones that are typically on television, although not exclusively on television. But I mean, consider the way Paul describes them here. I think of my own background and some of the things that I've seen uh, you know, still being uh, promoted today in the health and wealth movement, the abundant life movement, the victorious life movement. I think Paul is addressing those people. It's not that God doesn't bless, but I mean, what these people do is they, they get you to focus on your worldly pleasure and how much money you can have and how God wants you to have all the, all, everything your heart desires of the world, God wants you to have. And he wants you to have this victorious life where you don't have any problems. But you know what? That doesn't describe the Christian life as I read it in the Bible. It tells me it's going to be just the opposite. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, and men hate you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you on, on account of me. Okay? No. Everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That does not describe what these guys are describing. Okay, so this is real. It is happening within the church. And we've had, throughout the history of this church, when we were a little bit larger years ago, we had people coming into this church that are issue-driven or had a particular pet doctrine, and they just kind of, you know, they use that to divide the church, sadly. Now, one thing we should ask is this. Why does God allow that to happen? Um, there is an answer to that question. Paul says... It's so that we will learn to distinguish truth from error. If we're never exposed to it, then we never you know, have to learn to overcome it or learn what's wrong about it and the outcome of it. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 18 through 19, he says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. Notice, for there must also be factions among you. There must be factions so that those who are approved may become evident among you. So there's, there's a, a method behind, I won't call it madness, but it may seem like madness, of why these things would happen in, in the Lord's church. Shouldn't we expect unity? Shouldn't we expect peace? I remember Al Martin one time addressing that, you know, as, as young ministers were experiencing problems in their congregations and They'd come to him and say, why are all these things happening? I want a New Testament church, a church that's full of love and, and unity, and everybody's agreeing, everybody's working together and serving each other. And then Al Martin would say, well, which church are you talking about? Because uh, none of the New Testament churches actually had that. You know, are you talking about the Corinthian church? Are you talking about, yeah, Paul wrote to address all the issues that they were struggling with. That is a part of, of the Christian life, and this is the reason, so that we can learn from these experiences to be able to tell the difference between truth and error. 
So let me close now with just some things that Paul says here about the antidote. How can we defeat the enemy? You know, we recognize that he's, he's here, he's trying to sow division, but what can we do about it? First of all, we can't stop them from coming to the meetings of the church, right? It's open to everyone. And interestingly, we can't even stop them from becoming members. You know, all the things that I experienced were from previous members of the church. You know, the session does do a careful examination uh, for every candidate for membership. But the bottom line is we can't see the heart. And we don't know everything that they believe. We only know what they say they believe, okay? And by the way, people do tend to hide the things they don't want you to see. That's, I know that's surprising to you. You probably didn't know that was the case. But if they know that they're out of sorts with the church and that they could potentially be bringing something divisive into the church, I mean, we've had people come in who knew that. And as soon as they got in here, began to work to undermine it, even though they said they wouldn't do that if they held to anything that, that might be different than what the church believes. Yeah, and we've seen people coming to the church with agendas. We've had plenty of those in the past, and those things tended to divide the church as well because everybody wants the church to focus on the issue that they believe is most important. I mean, I understand that. But no one should really try to take the wheel of the church and begin to get the church to go their direction. That, that's, that's one of the divisive things that can happen. So we can't avoid that from, from happening. You know, people come into the congregation who may have these uh, particular agendas, but the question is, how, what, what should we do about it? What can we do when it takes place? Well, first of all, Paul tells us, keep your eyes open. Be on the lookout. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learn. So, be aware. Secondly, when we find somebody who's actually falling into this category, by the way, I don't have anybody in mind here this morning. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not thinking anybody here is working to undermine the church. I'm just talking about this certainly can happen. But when that happens, he says, turn away from them. You know, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Well, that sounds kind of unloving. Turn away from him. Uh, keep away from every brother, every sister who might do this. Well, that's what Paul says. And then he says in verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Okay, so this is another way we deal with it. We, we see who they are. We turn away from them. We don't fellowship with them while they're involved in this divisive behavior so that they will be put to shame. And also so that it won't affect us or infect us, I should say. But the second step would be if, they, if that isn't enough, okay, to get them to amend, we do need to enact church discipline. Now, Paul doesn't directly address that here, but we do need to, to do that. If they don't stop and they're a member, you know, we should alert the elders. And uh, if they're just visitors, you know, we, we need to do the same thing, don't we? We need to make sure we don't let it progress. We don't let it infect. We don't let it divide. And then I think third, Paul says to better recognize this false teaching and false teachers, we need to train ourselves to be able to recognize the difference between truth and error, uh, between good behavior and bad behavior. And we need to be practicing that truth because as we were reminded before, it's one thing to know what God wants us to do. It's another thing to do it. And we don't really know it well unless we can actually do it. If we don't know how to apply a truth, we really don't understand that truth, do we? So by applying it, we learn more about it. We have our senses trained to discern good and evil. And I do believe that's why Paul is commending the Romans. He says, this is what you were doing. He says in verse 19, for the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you. These false teachers are not infecting you, but... I want you to be wise in what is good. Learn that truth and apply that truth. And innocent in what is evil, avoid those things. And again, how do you do that? But by studying the Word of God. 
Paul says if, if they follow that counsel, if we follow that counsel, Paul says the God of peace would soon crush Satan under their feet. And I don't think he means by that a final and full destruction of Satan himself just because of what this one church is doing. But what he's saying is you will stop what Satan is trying to do in your church. You will defeat him. You will, he will be subdued under you. And that um, is really what the Lord intends. Uh, when the Satan was subdued under our Lord's feet, he has given us, by his grace, the ability also to subdue the enemy's tactics and his work in our life. He has placed him under our feet. Now, finally, Paul closes with a short prayer, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I just simply want to say about this, the only way that we can do this, okay, the only way we can know God's truth versus error, practice what is good and avoid evil is through the help he provides by the Holy Spirit. So he prays for that help, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that grace? It's the grace of the Holy Spirit to help us to be able to do what he calls us to do. So let's do two things. Let's look to him in prayer now for his help. And let's also prepare to receive it as we come to the table. Okay, so as we're praying, let's do these two things. Let's pray.